We live in a constantly changing world where the speed of information is changing how we think and act and connect with one another. When people in a society lose faith in their institutions, in God and in each other, the nation collapses. We need help rebuilding trust and tying it all together. Welcome to All That To Say, a podcast exploring the interrelatedness of all things in long-form conversation. John Pistol, university president and former director of the TSA and deputy director of the FBI, joins Jim Lyon to share stories of the mob, the intelligence world, and how his faith grounds him in his work. John, I am so anxious to have a conversation with you because your life has so many intersections of fascinating places. Mm. And uh, you started out thinking you were going to be an attorney. Is yes, that right? I mean, I you, did. you dreamed of that. You went to law school. Yeah, sure. Okay, but what happened? How did you get from law school to, let's say, the FBI, which is where your career really um, unpacked? Well, yeah, Jim, and thanks uh, for having me on the program. It's it's a joy and an honor to be here uh, with your staff and, and uh, with, with your audience. So, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. So, yeah, I wanted to be a lawyer, and if I was being completely honest, probably rich and famous, if if I could be. And if you um, had to choose between rich or famous, what would yeah, you Yeah, I debated those. <laughs> so it was a question, okay, probably, eh, I don't know. Yeah, so it yeah. depends on what day. Let's shoot for both. Yeah, might as well go for both. Um, and so I passed the bar exam here in Indiana and uh, joined a law firm, uh, which is actually, it was four Uh, attorneys who were all part of the Church of God movement and who had gone before me at Anderson University. And so it was joining a good pedigree, if you will, in Anderson, Indiana. Because this this was your community. You were a part of the Church of God. This is where I grew up. You grew up in it. Your your dad actually was on the faculty at the university, which is a Church of God school. Yeah. And my mom was a public school teacher and the favorite teacher of many students. So she taught psychology and, and people just loved her because it's outside the box type of things. Right, right. So yeah, that's and as a lawyer, you w- want to build up a client base where you are known and your name is known. And fortunately, I grew up in a great family and youngest four kids and and so my family name was known and I'd been fortunate to be involved in some high school athletics and and got some some attention in that regard. Right. So, so yeah, so you, you are a thing in Anderson, so Indiana. It made sense. We're actually in Anderson right now and yeah. this is a city which is on the northeast side of the Met Metropolitan area of Indianapolis, right. uh, and, and you started in a law firm there. You had you yeah. had everything going for you. You got the degree. Yeah. You've got the relationships. You've got the uh, the name. Right. But you didn't stay with it. No. What, what happened? There was a discomfort, I think, in my soul, if you will. Uh, in addition, just to to the economic realities, I started practicing um, in, in in the early '80s when the country was in a recession. And um, in 1981, where interest rates were really high and, and the economy was, was suffering here in Anderson because of the layoff of a number of, of General Motors workers. Because this was a town that was defined oh, by General Motors and that was receding then. 25,000 people in the town worked for General Motors at, at different plants, you know, out of a city of 75 or 80,000 people. So it was a, clearly a, a one company town in, in that respect. Uh, but I just had a sense that this is not what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Uh, I was doing uh, a, law, a general practice of law, a little bit of specialty and some tax and estate planning, uh, but just a, a wide variety of things. And the bottom line was the bottom line. <laughs> so how much money was I bringing in and yep. to the firm's benefit and, and, of course, for my own benefit? And I just thought, Oh, I don't want to do this for the next 40 years. Was it part of the work? I mean, the, the business side of it, there's, mm-hmm. there's not enough client base, you know, in the context of the time, but was was practicing law, actually doing the law work itself, was that just not a buzz it, like you thought it might be? It, you know, it was okay, but it was it was like I, I, I've tried it yeah. and thought, okay, that I tried it and... But what was a challenge for me, Jim, was with just with my ego, to say, uh, because I had social status yes, uh, right. at, as, an, as a lawyer, you know, attorney at large, but you know, yes, right. you know, attorney at law, and the sense of, well, if I walk away from the practice of law, aren't I admitting that I'm a failure? Because mm-hmm. successful lawyers, they stay with it for a career. And, and that's generally true. Well, and, and you put a lot into getting there. I mean, Absolutely. I, 
you know, some of my story, I went to law school right. and I dreamed of impassioned pleas before the bar. I got into law school. I went two years at the University of Washington and I dropped out. I mean, you're way ahead of me. I'm just, I'm trying to yeah, beef yeah. you up. <laughs> I, I wrestled no, no. with the whole ego thing. Like, how could I start this? Right. I had planned it from the age of 14. I was going mm. to law school. My parents poured into it and I had to make a decision because when I got into it, I thought, man, I, I don't know if I want to do this for my lifetime. Right. So I'm resonating with you. Yeah. You came to a point, actually, but I'm just saying, you're a bigger man than me, John. Mm -hmm. you, you carried it through the school. You got the practice established. But then what happened? I mean, you got to the FBI. How did that happen? Well, slowly. <laughs> <laughs> and just uh, as an encouragement to any of your listeners who might know somebody who's applying for a job in the federal government, particularly one where you get a security clearance, to be patient but be persistent. <laughs> Because it took me a year, uh, and this was back early 80s, pre-internet, so it was all paper-based. But twice during that year-long process, um, the FBI told me that they would not be able to hire me. Thanks for my application, look good and everything, but uh, we're not going to be able to hire you uh, for two different reasons, all of which was on the application. They said they learned things. <laughs> Um, but you fully disclosed at the beginning. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, and one was simply in going to the VA hospital for my physical. Uh, the doctor had forgotten uh, to check the box at the end of the physical saying, applicant is capable of engaging in strenuous physical activity. Well, that's, that became a red flag because going back to my senior year of high school, uh, I had a defining moment where I was in a car accident and ended up with a broken neck. Ouch. And um, thought I would either be paralyzed or or not survive. But thanks be to God, I had not only a full physical healing, but a, a spiritual healing, which we can talk about if, if you're interested. But that uh, I was able to play four years of college basketball and tennis in following that. So I had a full physical recovery, was, was in really good shape when I applied to the FBI. And so we worked it out. I went back for the no another physical with a different doctor, and I said, can you make sure you check that <laughs> you box while I'm box sitting going. here? <laughs> I mean, there's so much there, John. <clears throat> uh, you get into the FBI, but why the FBI? I mean, I'm, just, I'm just trying to imagine. I went to law school. Yeah. When I left law school, I got a job at Northwest Airlines, <laughs> uh, now merged into Delta. But sure. what made you think, oh, I'll knock on the FBI door? Well, it was intriguing, and that was one of several options that I was looking at. I looked at other law firms, both here in town and the state of Indiana. Uh, part of it was uh, I married my college sweetheart, Kathy Harp, who was from the D.C. area. And D.C. always had an allure for me. I was able, as a sophomore in college, to do an internship with my congressman from Indiana. And I just found D.C. fascinating. And so I, there was some allure there. I looked at a couple of firms in D.C., um, but it just wasn't a good fit from what what I was interested in and what they were interested in. And uh, so I, I was curious about um, security services and investigations, I think, just as from a kid, just being. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to practice law. I didn't want to go just straight to the FBI. And so when I was making this decision of, and praying for discernment. Okay, God, I thought you wanted me to be a lawyer. That's not where I feel like I'm really called to be. What does that look like? And the FBI was one of several options that I looked at, um, in, in addition, uh, in full disclosure, to, to the CIA. And yeah. so the idea of living overseas and working for the government and things, I, I thoroughly enjoy travel. And so. There's something about you that wanted the adventure. Yeah. I mean, that's both, of, both of those <laughs> channels are going to lead you to some unexpected, unusual yeah. adventures. That's, that's just the nature absolutely. of it. Absolutely. That's right. And as you jumped into the FBI, I mean, you went to the top. <laughs> I mean, you well, went all the way to the highest ranking and level of FBI life. Uh, you know what, John, we have on alongside with us, Ryan Woolsey, he's uh, uh, one of our production guys, and and Ryan uh, is a graduate of your alma mater also, Anderson University. Anderson and University, hey, Ryan, go Ravens. Right, R Ryan, so glad to have you alongside. And as we're talking, Ryan, he pulled up the FBI emblem, the Federal Bureau of oh, Investigation. I yeah. mean, it is so fine. I mean, it's, it's kind of an iconic yeah. brand. You dived into it all in. I did. You served in different places, but ultimately ended up number two at the FBI. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. The okay. deputy director, the highest uh, career position in the FBI. Because after that, you have to be appointed by the president. That's right. And confirmed by the Senate. So yeah, that's right. the director's job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you went all up to that yes, ceiling, so to speak. And so you've worked with some of the, the famous names <laughs> of current events. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, so yeah, who yes. was the director when you were number two? 
So Robert Mueller. Uh, uh, I've he, heard of him. He, some people have heard <laughs> of him. Uh, and yeah, he became special counsel. He served for 12 years. The FBI director's term is historically a 10-year term following J. Edgar Hoover serving 48 years and Congress saying, that's too long. Yep. So he served 10 and then um, President Obama asked him to stay on a couple extra years. So he did. So he did. And, and uh, greatly respected in his absolutely. FBI service, absolutely. absolutely. And you would say that the FBI itself esteemed him. I mean, the sure the people who worked under his supervision were were fans. Well, yes, generally. I mean, he didn't suffer fools lightly. <laughs> so if you <laughs> if you were not performing up to his expectations, um, yeah, that you he, maybe he, were he not a, a fan. He was a straight <laughs> shooter, so to speak. He was a straight shooter. Yes. Okay, and so Ryan has just pulled up a picture of his successor. There's Robert Mueller and James Comey who oh, followed sure, him. Right. Uh, James Comey is, I think, one of the tallest people I've ever seen in person. <laughs> what is he, he about six eight? He's six eight. Yeah. Yeah, and so in this photograph, uh, we see a uh, Jim Comey standing above Director Mueller. Okay. But, but they they um, pass a baton one to another. You right. also worked with Comey though previously, right? Well, you're right. So Jim Comey had been the Deputy Attorney General with uh, uh, John Ashcroft in the first uh, or, or President Bush forty three, the second uh, or the, the first term of. of uh, Bush 43. And so he would come over with the attorney general every morning to the FBI headquarters in downtown D.C. for a morning intelligence briefing before the director and the attorney general or their deputies mm -hmm. uh, would go to the White House to, to brief the president, vice president, and um, a handful of others in the senior leadership team. So. so that put you in the same room, so to speak. You had some lots of interaction. A but didn't interaction. you also serve together in the New York office, you and Comey? No, no. no he was did? a he was a federal prosecutor um, in Richmond, Virginia, and then was appointed um, as a U.S. attorney in New York, um, okay. the Southern District of New York, before he became Deputy Attorney General. But you worked in New York. I worked in New York. I, yeah. And in those Almost days, five years. I mean, there's so much about John Pistol that, like, national security and so on. But before I get there, hmm. I mean, you spent a lot of your FBI career chasing down the bad guys in the mob. I well, mean, am, am I being too cavalier with that? Or well, I, so not a long time, about five years. But well, yeah, but in the yeah. I suppose chasing the mob for me <laughs> would seem like a long time. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so I was uh, assigned. So in, in when I first graduated from the FBI Academy, uh, I was assigned to Minneapolis and spent three winters there and did some fascinating work, worked work with some great people, and then was transferred to, to the New York office where I was assigned to a joint organized crime task force of FBI agents and NYPD detectives focused on one of the five uh, organized crime called La Cosa Nostra, this thing of ours, so... Uh, mob families, um, uh, the mafia. And so, yeah, had some fabulous work. It's what's referred to as a target-rich environment, uh, the mob in the 80s in New York City. So, yeah. Target-rich meaning there are a lot of cases you might pursue. Absolutely. <clears throat> and you found yourself in the middle of that. Yes. And uh, just name one. Just name one of those mob, I, I, I don't even have the vocabulary, one of the mafia bosses. Well, so Vincent uh, Giganti, um, and he went by the moniker the Chin. Um, he was a boss of the Genovese family, which was the largest of the five mafia families in New York. And, and at that time, there were 26 uh, LCN, La Cosa and, Nostra families. And uh, Ryan's pulled up a picture of you uh, arresting him. It looks like you're walking right alongside of oh, the Chin. Yeah. This is the New York Daily News front cover. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, so and, and if uh, and he's wearing a purple bathrobe in, in that. Wow. Um, because that he was photo. at home. Yeah, so <laughs> the arrest team that I was leading, uh, we went to his apartment in Greenwich Village, just south of Washington Square Park in New York University, where he he lived to uh, to wake him up. And uh, we we used what uh, the euphemism is, we had a master key if in case he would not open the door. And so it's a 26-pound sledgehammer, two-person sledge that you, so myself and a lead detective from NYPD use that to, Help him open the door, and so yeah, we we got in, and and it was early morning. And he was just getting and he up. Was there. Well, he was there. okay, so <clears throat> give us a picture of the chin. I mean, just as as a person, but also as a type of of criminal offense. Well, why is he in the crosshairs of the law? What's he doing that yeah. makes it problematic? So the big uh, tool that the FBI and Department of Justice, U.S. Attorney's Office had was what's called the RICO statute, the Racketeer Influence Corrupt Organization statute, because you could bring in any number of different individual criminal offenses. It might be murder, it might be extortion, loan sharking, which is high interest rate loans, and and then all these other things. Um, and so if we could indict uh, the Chen or anybody else on, on RICO charges, that had enhanced penalties and allowed you to bring in a lot of information 
as evidence that you wouldn't be able to in a individual case. murder case, for instance. Exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah, he was charged with RICO and a number of, of extortion schemes. And that's because one of these crime families actually would have their fingers in many different criminal sure. pursuits. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And so if he's the head of that, he's held responsible for a lot of what goes on beyond his own fingerprint. Is that fair? Well, yes. You have to obviously show that there's some culpability by the individual, but there are a lot of individual acts perhaps by subordinates who could be attributed because mm -hmm. he gave direction he's, and guidance. Yeah, yeah. In the law. Sure. They were agents of the company, so yeah, to speak. Yeah, basically. And so it had to be held accountable. Yeah. So uh, how did that go down? You, you get the guy in his house. I mean, again, I, I'm hearing you talk mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm just like watching TV. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, let me go this way. Well, you, you, you come to a door. You don't, this is a mafia boss that you're going to take down that morning, mm -hmm. ostensibly by surprise. Hopefully. Do you have any, I mean, you've got to have some anxiety or what's going to happen if well, I beat the door down? Is that, are, are the people going to come shooting out? Yeah, I mean, how exactly. does that work? Well, that's, of course, the, and the, the whole premise of an FBI-led investigation, especially into to high-risk uh, arrestees, if you will, those yep. where they're arresting, is that you overwhelm the person with both surprise and, and show of force. So not only did we have, it wasn't just the two of us, the detective me, yes. we, we had a group yes. of 10 at the front door to provide perimeter security for the front in case some of his subordinates showed up or came out of another. And this is an apartment building. He was on the first floor. But then we also had a team around back in case he decided to try to get out the back or sure. somebody came sure. in sure. to help. But the whole thing about him, which was interesting, is that he was alleged to be um, insane and not culpable of standing trial. And for 20 years leading up to the time that we arrested him, he had checked himself into a, a psychiatric hospital uh, there in New York City for two weeks, every summer. You mean before the arrest? Bef for 20 years. He, you're telling he was me that laying he. laying the groundwork. I, I'm, I'm reading between <clears throat> your lines here. <clears throat> that he feigned a mental illness yes. for years as a way of protecting himself from prosecution. Decades, two decades he did wow. that. So yeah. And, and just a, one other anecdote, um, but for example, if he thought that uh, we had him under surveillance, for example, in, again, in Greenwich Village, a popular tourist area and everything, he'd be walking around in his purple bathrobe and his little chapeau and uh, perhaps with somebody and uh, if he thought that we were watching him and taking photographs and maybe trying to get some overhears, you yes, know, yes, on, sure. all this. Um, w one time, for example, he went out in the middle of the street and started urinating. And this is in the middle of the day. You got tours walking around and all this. And it's like, okay, is this guy crazy? And as some people said, yeah, he's crazy like a fox. So it took quite a while to have him demonstrated uh, to the court that he was he was actually competent. He was yeah. mentally competent. Yes. And uh, you're describing a man who very, in a very sophisticated way, yes. managed his, uh, yeah. himself, yeah. his persona yeah. to deceive right. a world around him. But ultimately, he was, he was arrested. He was prosecuted. And, well, con and convicted. Yeah, it took seven years to get to trial. From, I, I, when I arrested him in 1990, it was actually seven years later before he actually went to trial. And then he was eventually convicted and sentenced to prison and then eventually died in prison. So, so, so now I'm, I'm thinking, how, how did you come to the conclusions? Or, or maybe, maybe this is a question of our time where there's so many questions about truth mm. uh, today in our country, uh, maybe in the world. But, you know, as an FBI agent working to apprehend someone who's involved in many dimensions of crime, clearly mm. a, a threat to the public interest. And you have to examine evidence. You have to make decisions. Maybe he actually, I watched him in the street urinating. So, you know, is that man really mentally competent or is there really a criminal mind here? To walk me through how you as an agent professionally uh, yeah. evaluate truth. How do you scrub sources of information and make decisions about this is credible, that's not? Right. And, and that's a key because two of the aspects of any criminal investigation and prosecution is... One, um, is it uh, relevant information? And then two, if it is relevant to proving a person's conduct, is it admissible? So, for example, you may have a uh, single source of information that says this guy is committing murder or having orders murder done, like um, Sammy Gravano, the underboss of the Gambino family, killed or had killed 19 people. He, he admitted that because mm -hmm. he became a government witness. 
So, but is that based on a single source of information? And so we would always try to corroborate the information. So we had to look at the source of the information. Is that credible? And then if it is, was it collected in a lawful manner so it would be admissible in a court of law? So those are two of the key components. And so that's what made it both a challenge and an opportunity because if you had a single source saying he's doing these things, if you could corroborate that, that would lend credibility. But you also have to realize that everybody in a position of power that was uh, like in the mob had competitors. And so I had a number of people who were cooperating with me, providing information, because they wanted to take out the competition. Yeah, because they could use you to take out their their competitor. Yeah. Right. But so it's a complex weave, but honestly what you're describing is just like in any court case. Sure. That evidence is strengthened when you have multiple sources. Right. And the credibility of the evidence always has to be tested against cooperating uh, voices or circumstances. It, sure. It's not enough simply to allege or to say, I think, or I know by myself. No, that's right. No, that's, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's not uh, good evidence. So, and, right. and honestly, I mean, it seems like it has some application today in our current events. Well, you know, that when we're pummeled with all kinds of uh, information, we have to scrub it down and make sure that we don't just drink from a single stream. Exactly. That we look for, uh, analytically, we look for, well, if that person is right, then this would also, correct. you know, and another credible source would authenticate that and so on. And maybe that's part of our challenge these days right. uh, is that so many streams of information are now populating our our stimuli. Yeah. And credible, uh, or, or where once there was a kind of sense of body of sources that were seen as credible, that has been diminished in our minds. You know, the public mind is now questioning Well, that's right. Everything. And, and, and I think, to your point, there's a risk of relying on a single source of information for your understanding of whether it's current events or history, because there's always some uh, bias or prejudice, whether uh, intentional or obvious, but every writer or every producer or whatever, there's something that comes into yeah. that equation. There's a lens. Yeah, we there's all a have lens. One. There's a paradigm that people... Well, and sometimes through. with intention, just like you were saying, someone in a, in a mafia competitive system is by design, yeah. configuring information to achieve their outcomes, even if it's not altogether hinged to the truth. Right. And yeah, I know that you worked, your uh, your career, even just five years, you're saying in New York with uh, the mafia uh, cases. Uh, you may remember this, I have a son named Peter, another yes. AU alum, who met you once at a dinner table where I was present. <laughs> he is all about the mafia. I don't know mm. what it is in high school. He's now uh, in his mid-30s, but in high school, he got really interested in that. He started reading all these books. And I have to say, I was so amazed because he's not normally just straight up going to meet a stranger and start talking, but he knew who you were. So he just dived in and said, oh, <laughs> and he started asking you names of these yeah. mafia people and you were able to intersect with him. I mean, you guys went on like speaking a foreign language <laughs> <laughs> because... Forget I mean, about it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. I mean, you, you were ready for film that day. Well, and John, that's an important contribution you've made to our public life. Thank you for that. <laughs> but having said that, yes. your your career at the FBI morphed, actually, now into more of the national security side. Right. After 9-11, <clears throat> I think. Is that fair? Is yes. That kind of? So, yes. I, um, I eventually transferred to FBI headquarters, continued working organized crime, then went to Indianapolis and supervised a group of agents investigating white collar crime and civil rights and a, a newly emerging area called cyber crimes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we went to Boston and served as the number two agent in charge of the Boston office, which covered basically New England states. And uh, and then 9-11 the happened. And then I was asked to come to headquarters. And I'd, I'd been on what's called the inspection staff for a short time. And yeah. of course, 9-11 <clears throat> is a seminal moment in our our national consciousness. You know, it's, it's amazing to think that there are people graduating from high school now yeah. who were not alive then. Right. But for anyone who lived through it, yeah. it's seared in our memory. Uh, Ryan's pulled up a picture of the famous Twin Towers and mm. uh, here they are on fire after planes were deliberately mm. crashed into them. It just grieves me. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's easy to forget sometimes the yeah. traumatic experience that all of us in this country, and I think worldwide, understood how innocent people on a plane could be used as a weapon yeah. to wreak so much havoc. I mean, and then the threat. I remember John, and I, I suppose everyone has a memory, but after after that day unfolded, 
I live in Indiana. I live across the street from a, corn, a cornfield. I mean, it seems quite mm. mundane and mm. out of the way. But I remember thinking, as many people did, well, what's next? Because we didn't know what the sh next shoe would be to drop. And so I, I imagined that a nuclear power plant in northern Indiana, though far removed from my house by miles, still proximate enough that if there was damage done, sure. would I be affected? I, I just began oh, to yeah. think about my family and... Sure. Uh, are, my, we, are we safe? Are we safe? And anyway, so in that cauldron, yeah. you are catapulted mm. into a national security role. Yes. Tell me about you in those days. What were you thinking? How did that come down? Did, were you able to say, you know what, this is my job, I focus, I'm trained to do this, or man, I don't know, I need to watch my house. Yeah, so it's um, so it was, it was several months after 9-11 before I was officially invited in. Um, and I was five, by this time, um, I was, again, in the senior executive service, but not involved in counterterrorism. And um, so I was asked whether I would uh, put in for uh, what's called the Deputy Assistant Director in the Counterterrorism Division, the number two person, uh, by a friend of mine who was an Assistant Director, which is above that. And I, uh, I said, no, because I feel like a, a leader is somebody who is uh, somebody who knows the way and shows the way and can go the way. And I'd only worked on one counterterrorism investigation in my, I'd been in the FBI 18 years by the time 9-11 happened. And so I didn't feel qualified. And I thought if anything that was needed, not only for the FBI, but for the country now, is to have qualified, well-experienced people. And I didn't feel qualified or well-experienced. So I said, no. He said, well, you, your name's being thrown around. And, and uh, I'd never met Robert Mueller before, before that. And... Um, and then had an opportunity to brief him on, on an inspection I had done of the Philadelphia office, totally unrelated to counterterrorism. And um, I, I'm not quite sure how it all happened, but then my boss's boss called me and said the same thing, and I said no. And I knew I could say no to them because they were friends. Eventually, the deputy director, uh, the senior career person, as we mentioned, uh, called and said, hey, I think um, that, you know you, there's a lot of good word about you that you'd be good for the counterterrorism division. And I said, Bruce, you, you know I don't have the background. He said, no, but that's what the director is looking for, to bring in some fresh eyes and, and frankly, somebody who hasn't been tainted by 9-11. Well, and, you know, as you're, as you're describing this, John, uh, you were trusted. I mean, I'm just guessing. Well, you had a record. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, but yeah. apart from the experiential resume that we would imagine would be a prerequisite, mm. you had a reputation already established that you could be trusted. They had yeah. confidence that if we give you this assignment, that character, mm. character mattered more yeah. than your resume performance because they knew that this had to be a, I'm just, oh, yeah. what am I know? Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, I'm guessing they- It sounds uh, good, I like big, that, let's go with well, that. <laughs> I'm just saying, uh, don't we all, uh, sure. as, a, as an American, I want to believe that the person that's going to sit in that chair right. is someone I can trust, who's not in this for themselves, but who has a, a native commitment right. to the common good and will sacrifice themselves to yeah. do the right thing and be honest and so on. I mean, I'm hearing you describe a scenario where other people saw that in you and yeah. ultimately you acquiesced to their invitation. Well, not to theirs, but then the deputy director said, well, just want to give you a heads up, the director may be reaching out for you. <laughs> well, <laughs> the FBI is somewhat of a, I mean, quasi-militaristic, and, and if the commander asks you to do something, you either say yes or you find other <laughs> work, frankly. Right, right. You're and not going to be given options. No. This and is where we need you. And so the director called me. I was in San Antonio on an inspection, and um, and his assistant was his name Wanda, she said, uh, Mr. Pistol, um, or the, you know, the, the switchboard in San Antonio said, uh, the, uh, the director's assistant Juan is on the phone. I thought, uh oh, that's not uh -oh. good. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so she said, hold for the director. So he came on and said, hey, I, I know we don't know each other, but you have a great reputation and I need you to, to serve. Are you willing to do that? And so we had a good conversation. Because the other thing I didn't feel qualified about, I had not served as what's called the special agent in charge of one of the 60, 56 field offices. So the SAC, that's a big deal in the FBI. And everybody in leadership had served. Kind of goes through that journey. Absolutely. That's yeah. just one of the boxes you check. Yeah. And, and I, I, <laughs> I should have said, I had 
was in consideration for a promotion to an SAC, special agent in charge, for four different offices in one package, if you will. There are a number of different, four different jobs being considered. And I had a friend, I'll call it a source, in the career board who told me I was the number one candidate in two of those four packages. So I felt pretty... Uh, like I'm going somewhere with pretty this. Pretty good. I'm yeah. going to be an SAC in one of these two offices, probably. And you jumped over that, essentially. And, well... Yeah, you, were, I, you were pulled over that. I was pulled over that, yeah. So. Well, but that also... <clears throat> it also says to me, in extraordinary times, which that's what it was, yeah. extraordinary adaptations are made. Yes. And uh, so there you were. But now, as you as you came into the role, yeah. I know that you found yourself in the George W. Bush years, mm -hmm. actually having to, actually having to, I mean, part of your responsibility right. was to be at the White House and to inform right. the president about what's out there. Uh, that is a role continued on into the Obama years uh, for a season. Give me, give me a picture. <laughs> First visit to the Oval Office, uh, wearing your new hat. How does that go down? Yeah, it, it was uh, fascinating and um, overwhelming in terms of, I can't believe... I, John Pistol, from Anderson, Indiana, am going into the Oval Office with the President of the United States, the Vice President, the National Security Advisor, the Chief of Staff, Attorney General. And um, so, yeah, I remember it was, on, it was on a Friday afternoon, and I went with uh, Director Mueller because the director was going to be out the following week. And this is where we're, uh, we're briefing every morning uh, at 8.30, and after we have a you know, 7 o'clock briefing at the FBI office and with the Attorney General and the, just to get prepared for it. And so the director, Director Mueller, told me a couple things. Don't speak unless you're spoken to. Um, and if it's the president, say, yes, Mr. President, and get back. And then the second thing, and even more importantly, obviously, was if you don't know the answer to the question, don't make it up. If, if, if you know what it is, well, fine, but don't make it up because you are there as a source of information and credibility and reliability. And if you lose any of those, then you're of no value. You're host. Yeah. So that's not so much about you were first meeting President George W. Bush. Yes. That was his advice in your job. That, don't ever try and just yes. cover an answer. No. You admit when you don't know and say, sure. I'll get one. Yeah. Or tell him what you know, but don't well, right. pretend. And yeah. I didn't think, yeah, I thought, well, sure, I'm not going to make something up. And so that was on a Friday. Monday, I go in uh, by myself. Well, I'm with the Attorney General, uh, John Ashcroft at the time. And um, did the, oh, oh, I should say, uh, on that Friday morning, leaving the office. So I didn't say anything. And as I was leaving the Oval Office, everybody files out. The president says, okay, thanks. And everybody, thank you, Mr. President. Everybody <laughs> gets up. And I'm just about out of the Oval Office. And I hear the president say, pistol. And I remembered, I said, I turned and said, yes, Mr. President. And he said, Next time, don't say so much. And then gave me this little smile. And what I said, yes, Mr. President. <laughs> I was so uptight. Uh, but it, it, just a sense of here's a real human being. He's helping me to feel comfortable um, in my own skin. He's and, acknowledging, and, I see you, and yes. I'm, I'm telling you, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. And Monday, I go in and do the briefing, fine. Tuesday, same thing. Wednesday... Through the briefing, the president asked me something, and I knew the first part of it and answered that because, you yeah. know, you start like to hear yourself talk. You're in the <laughs> Oval Office. You're briefing the president, the vice president. You know, yeah, this yeah. is pretty cool stuff. And then I heard in my mind speculating what the next part of the question was, and I almost started to say something, and fortunately I caught myself and heard myself saying, but I'm not sure about the second part of that question, Mr. President, so let me get that, and I'll get back yes, with your yes, staff. right, right. But you followed good advice. And he said, oh, yeah, fine, thanks. It's yeah. no big deal. But if I had been right, oh, I was lucky. If I'd been wrong, I was toast. Well, and again, the president, George Bush at that time, <laughs> is developing trust. I mean, exactly. that's, uh, that's your thing. And, you know, as you're describing that whole uh, episode, I have to wonder, a briefing. You have a 7 a.m. briefing, then mm -hmm. you're going to the White House to get the president. Just help us understand, what's a briefing? I mean, it's like a, oh, sure. an assessment of what? Yeah, so it's a over basically, um, for example, at the FBI briefing with the Attorney General and Deputy Attorney General um, and the FBI leadership team of three or four of us, uh, there would be a CIA analyst who would come in and give us what happened overnight, primarily in the global war on terror, as it was referred to, overseas. What was going on in Afghanistan? What was going on in Iraq? What was going on in Yemen? You know, wherever it might be. 
Um, and so that would be preparation for us then in terms of, so what's the FBI doing about it? And then, then we would have a domestic side of things, so what's going on here in the U.S.? And then we would agree, uh, so that would be you know, anywhere from 15, 20, maybe 30 minutes, depending on how much was there and questions. And we might see some aerial photos, some surveillance photos. We might, a lot of maps and things. And, and part of it was just an education. So right. learning about what's the difference between a Shiite and a Sunni Muslim and, you know, who are the leaders in the different, you know, just all those. It, it, all of it's in the package. Right. And the idea is to keep the president as surprised as possible right. about what's out there. Right. And you carried this role on. George Bush did two terms and then Barack Obama came and you continued to wear this hat. So, yes, uh, President Obama changed that daily briefing. Well, actually, President Bush in his second term, it went to once a week uh, briefing. And then when President Obama came into office, um, it was once a week, but it was in, in the Situation Room rather than the Oval Office, unless it was something really sensitive, mm -hmm. and a larger group. So it was a different format. And yes, but same. <clears throat> John yeah. Pistol is carrying the, the yeah. mail. Yeah. And uh, Ryan's pulled up a picture of uh, you uh, in the White House to speaking with President Obama. Oh, uh, yeah. Two different characters, Presidents Bush and Obama. Yeah, I mean, they're different so. styles. Sure, and so on. sure. How would you characterize th the two of them? Well, just... Uh, what did you learn? Yeah. Um, obviously, yeah, very different personalities and um, President Bush uh, engaging, as the example I, I gave, um, and asked good follow-up questions. Uh, he, he, My impression was he was much better in person than, than he came mm -hmm. across uh, That's right. in the media. Uh, President Obama was uh, obviously very smart and engaging. He liked to get a lot of his information through reading, and then he would ask very precise um, and it, uh, just good questions. And so uh, it would really d depend on, he would drive the conversation uh, more so than President Bush would, let's say. But you say both of them were well-informed and oh, yeah. took it seriously and so on. Oh, yes. I know that you are a basketball guy. I mean, one of your uh -huh. most amazing stories is that you broke your neck yeah. and you went on to still play basketball in college. Right. Uh, President Obama's a basketball guy. Yeah, that's what I'd heard. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it, <laughs> Did you ever intersect with him? Because well, as my yeah. recollection is, he was oh. out there on the court with, yeah, he, you know, his attorney general or whatever. He played some hoops, yeah. And so, yeah, so after one of the early uh, briefings in the Situation Room, um, he had stood up, and of course everybody stands up when the president stands up, and he happened to look down. So I wasn't at the main table. I was uh, a backbencher, as they say. But for some reason, um, caught his eye, and I did the, the motion of shooting, uh, and he, his eyes got big and kind of smiled and he said, come here. <laughs> so I walked up past the other, you know, members of the cabinet and, and everything. And he said, what, what are you talking about? And I said, well, you know, we're six blocks down the street here at FBI headquarters. I don't know if you've heard, but we have a pretty nice wood floor, full court basketball court uh, in the basement of, of FBI headquarters. I said, oh, no. So I said, I just want to extend an official invitation to you to come play sometime. <laughs> he said, well, thanks. I might take you up on that. So then I thought, uh-oh, I opened my mouth, and um, I better get in shape because I haven't <laughs> been playing for a while. <laughs> well, we're going to do some uh, uh, pick-up ball here. Yeah, I'd hate to be embarrassed out there. And so I spent the next several weeks down on the court at lunchtime or after hours and trying to do some wind sprints and shooting, you know, just try to get my legs back and the touch and all that. And uh, didn't hear anything, didn't hear anything. And then several months later, the head of the FBI director's security detail on the morning brief said, uh, or before the morning brief, we'd have a conversation. He said, hey, you, you hear the uh, POTUS, President of the United States, P-O-T-U-S, uh, was in the gym over the weekend. And the director said, no, I didn't hear that. And I said, Really? <laughs> he came without calling he, me? <laughs> he came and brought his own group and uh, forgot to uh, to invite me. So I was disappointed on the one hand, but also relieved because I'd hate to be the person that uh, injured the president of the United States with an aggressive foul or something, well, or something like, like that. that. Or whatever. Or be the one introduced at the Situation Room next time yeah. who uh, can't make the hoop. Yeah, that would not be good. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, you'd... you'd John, your your life has because people trusted you. That's 
Mm -hmm. I'm just putting it out there. You don't have to own that, but I'm owning it for you. Because you developed a character that could be trusted, and you also proved in the discipline of your work, doors opened, and you found yourself the head of the TSA, the Transportation Safety Administration. Security which Administration. Which is a whole right. another chapter. I mean, a book could be written about that. Right. Uh, in an age where all of us following 9-11 were anxious sometimes about sure. what was it going to be like to be on a plane and... Uh, there were so many threats, not just the guy taking over the plane as they did 9-11, but the underwear bomber who finds a way right. to put explosives in his underwear right. on the famous uh, Christmas Day flight from Amsterdam. I mean, yeah. you, you, ha you had to come into a role now with a really unwieldy organization, what, about 65,000 employees? Yes, right. Yeah. And figure 450 out... 450 airports around the country. and Figure uh, out, yeah. what do I do? Uh, my guess is some of that has to be risk... Assessment. You know, yes. You're trying to calculate based on what we have experienced. Right. How do I tell the future? That's that exactly related? right. Yeah. And that, and so it was a great learning curve for me because uh, even though I'd been working in national security um, for well almost nine years at that time, because this is 2010 when when the president nominated me, and I, I do need to say for your viewers so they don't think too much here, but not only was I was not the first nominee, I was not the second nominee. <laughs> because the first two did not make it through the Senate confirmation process uh, for various reasons. And so I was a third nominee, um, but I was confirmable. And the key was I had a pulse. What you're telling me is there were two people proposed that could not pass muster with a Congress that was politically divided. Well, you know, I won't even say that, Jim. It was just they had failed to disclose some things in their background that if they'd been up front about, the one would have made it through, I'm sure, without a question. The other one, probably not, because it just... Yeah, but yeah, in the, but, in the sequence, there was one guy named John Pistol. That's right. Who got, who to, said the, yes. who got to the <laughs> table, who, right. who had fully disclosed and also had the trust. Again, yes. in the Congress, John, uh, it's my... My understanding, and it's not because I walk the halls of Congress, but I know some people. John Pistol is a guy yeah. who is respected wow. and trusted. Again, right. no matter where they are in the continuum of politics, right. there's a certain sense of, but that guy, he, he tells the truth, right. and he's not in it for himself, and so on. And anyway, right. you found your way there. So thank you for clearing that up so I could sure. polish you up a little more. <laughs> <laughs> but you take this job, and you have to think about What's the future? Yes. How, how do you do that? What, what's the criteria? How yeah. do you analyze? Yeah, so part of it was just trying to figure out what uh, I had inherited, because as, as your listeners know, the um, TSA was created after 9-11, and even before there was Department of Homeland Security. It was part of the Department of Transportation. So when DHS uh, was created uh, the following year, 2003, TSA moved over from uh, transportation to Homeland Security. But they adopted uh, and needed to, after 9-11, a one-size-fits-all policy that anybody flying could be a terrorist. And so we have to treat each person as such because if we miss it, then bad things happen. And there's a, they have, the TSA has a motto, so not on my watch. How many people would fly on an ordinary day? So at that time, 1.8 million on oh, average. Okay. But that's, that's yeah. a lot of suspects. That's a lot of suspects. And if you have a one-size-fits-all, it gives consistency and uniformity, but at a tough price in terms of public uh, embrace and, frankly, missing things. And so what I introduced was what we eventually called risk-based security, the idea that there's nearly 2 million people in the U.S., for example, who have a security clearance that uh, so allows them access to classified information. And so we have some trust in them. My question to the leadership of TSA is, so why is it that I've been allowed to get on a plane with a deadly weapon as an FBI agent for all these years, uh, 26, almost 27 years, um, and that's okay? And they said, well, that's different because you're an FBI agent. I said, well, that's my point. If we could identify... You've already been screened. Yes. Do some pre-screening by people who would volunteer information about themselves. Couldn't we treat them differently, do some type of expedited screening, and still do regular screening for everybody else, and then those who need additional screening, obviously, I'll do that. And so that's, so we uh, implemented risk-based security in 2011, and, um, and the, out of that, there were 25 different program changes, and the one that most people are familiar with is TSA PreCheck. And I'll just say, if your listeners 
like P- TSA PreCheck, I'll take full credit for that. <laughs> if there's anything about TSA they don't like, I'll give you the name of my successor two times removed, <laughs> and you can contact him. So, But it, as but a yeah. person who has done a lot of flying, it, it, it yeah. radically changed for the good and experience. And, and my sense is improved security, actually, it because then it allows a focus on a smaller right. uh, group of suspects, so to speak. Absolutely. And right. it's even moved to... I mean, things like Clear, which is not a government program, I don't understand, but no. it kind of works in sync, yeah. which uh, I also belong to, which yeah. allows a, a retina scan or a fingerprint, right. which identifies me without documents. Right. I mean, all of those are steps forward. But yeah. that's consequent to you looking forward. Like, we know that there have been threats on planes before. We know that planes have been used as weapons. We know that there are people in this world that will uh, not blink twice at putting innocent passengers on a plane at risk, you know that you have to assess what are the different ways that can happen, right? Right. So each new outrage, like an underwear bomber, yeah. makes you have to think, well, what about? Non-metallic what? IEDs, non-metallic, so non-metal improvised explosive devices, which Abdul Metallic uh, had the 25 year old Nigerian, on, as you mentioned, Christmas day, 2009, so, right. And so, so tell us about that, what was that? I mean, it's a well, non-metallic explosive. Yeah. So yeah, it's basically a liquid explosive. And so, for example, if if you had this, this bottle of water, uh, the amount of explosives was about exactly where the the bottom of the label is. That's about okay. how much I've had. That was the amount, and spread out, thinned, uh, and then put in almost like a diaper type of concealment. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, but it was provided by this master bomb maker in Yemen, um, who was part of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. AQAP is what it was called. And the beauty was you could walk through, from a terror standpoint, you could walk through a metal detector, which was standard in airports around the world, a mm-hmm. hundred times and, and never get through be because there's no metal in it. Yeah. And so... Um, How would it be a trigger, though? So he had a syringe with, a, um, with a, a chemical in it that when you inject that chemical into the, the liquids, that it mm-hmm. would just cause a combustible a combustion. Uh, mm-hmm. reaction that would hopefully, from a terror standpoint, explode. And we got video later of them using the same type device. Uh, they put it in a tree just on a limb to see, mm-hmm. and it blew the limb off. And so you can imagine a pressurized cabin of an aircraft with the damage that would cause. It doesn't have to be a truck bomb. It just has to no, pierce the... It would be catastrophic. And, and so how was that detected? I mean, why didn't that happen? It wasn't. So that's the thing. It wasn't detected. It, it, it didn't operate. Uh, property. It, so he actually pulled out the syringe. So yeah, I'm so, so the syringe, it was all one piece, if you will. Um, and there might even be some things on the internet that show that, but... Oh um, yeah, and in fact, you, Ryan's got that up. That's There's scary, a picture Ryan. of the guy and... Uh, yeah. Scary beyond belief, yeah. So, uh, so he actually injected it um, and it started burning as opposed to exploding. It didn't explode. And this alerted other passengers. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. And so... But that is really a malfunction. It was a malfunction. That saved it, the day. And I will say it was by the grace of God uh, because it should have and it could have. Now, the one other physical forensic part of it was he apparently had been wearing this device for a number of days um, in terms of his travel from Yemen yes, right, through right, different places right. to get to Amsterdam to, for the flight to Detroit. And it compromised its functionality. It, that's a, a generous way of saying that, I think. So, <laughs> yes. Well, I, I shouldn't, it's not, nothing funny about it, but no, yes. No. A flight from Amsterdam to Detroit, I think, was the, yes. the, right. the segment. And that whole thing could have been a disaster oh. for its magnitude. Absolutely. But he was apprehended because it didn't work. He, yeah. And so, he's what now, behind bars? Yeah, yeah. So he was convicted, actually pled guilty eventually, and yeah, serving a life sentence um, in U.S. prison. And then you have a moment where you have another intersection, and that is to leave the TSA mm. and become the president of Amsterdam University, the school that raised you up as a young man. Yes. That's where you are today. Yes. Yes. Uh, in fact, March 1 will be uh, my sixth anniversary, which is hard wow. to believe. But yeah, I was, I won't say fat, dumb, and happy as the head of TSA, but I'd been there for over four years, longest serving administrator, and, and still am, um, and somewhat proud of that because it's, it seemed to churn through the Yes, right. It was but, an uh, achievement of a kind. Now, my, the current uh, administrator, Dave Pekoski, has been given a five year term, which uh, um, didn't exist then. Didn't exist. And so, and the question is whether the new administration will keep him. <laughs> they don't right, have to. Right. But anyway, yeah, so I got a call one day about um, the, my 
thoughts about the next president of Vanish University, and this was a friend that I knew and trusted, and this was all confidential, but I said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm honored. Let me think about it. I'll, I'll call you back tomorrow with some names of folks. And he said, no, no, you don't understand. A small group just got together and thought you would be a good successor. <laughs> So I did just that. I chuckled, and, and what I thought to myself was, okay, I know Anderson University is a dry campus, but what are they smoking out there in Indiana? <laughs> What's going on? That would cause them to think of somebody without a background in higher ed that, uh, to be considered. And so, yeah. Well, this Anderson process. is a church-related university. It's yes. been born in this Church of God family that you and I both share. Yes. It is your alma mater. <clears throat> Pardon me, and... Uh, I know that there's a, as a way of illustrating why you're there, mm. I know that when James Comey was released by President Trump, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a headline that most people will remember sure. quite abruptly in the spring of 17. As, you know, he, he's in LA and uh, yeah. somebody reads it on the news and informs yes. him and he's out. Right. And of course, that's someone you knew personally. And sure. I, I remember uh, coming to your inauguration mm. as the president of the university, and James Comey spoke there. Yes, and that's why I say he's tall as me. I've met <laughs> because he. Yes. I don't. I'm six two, and I don't look up to a lot of people. And yeah. I tell you what, he's he, six eight. He towers. Every inch of it. Yeah, but he he was very impressive yeah, in that moment, is. and um, I remember him saying how powerfully you had impacted his life, mm. John. That he was there mm. at this relatively small university. This is not a, a school of the magnitude of a, you know, University no. of California or anything like that. Sure. It has a few thousand students, but still, yeah. he, he came from Washington, D.C. as the director then of the FBI to right. speak at your inauguration on behalf of his respect for you and yeah. his sense of your calling to the role. Yeah. He described how you had even spoken into his faith and mm. and, and helped him frame his, his faith in Christ. That, just all that to say that uh, when he was released, you found yourself invited to the Oval Office. Yes. And there you're in a meeting with Donald Trump mm -hmm. and I think the Vice President Mike Pence, yes. who are, uh, and maybe was it Jeff Sessions, the general? Yeah, the Attorney uh, General at the time. At the time yeah. that these, these men. General Counsel of the White House. Was had also there. invited you in to talk about the possibility. Mm -hmm. You have an FBI career. You're, you're well respected on both sides of the aisle, so on and so forth. Would you, would you be open to an ex an exploration of this, yeah. a conversation about that, and uh, what did you what did you say in reply? Well, uh, a little bit of context is whether when I was first contacted, I thought, "Wow, you know, I, I don't think Jim Comey should have been fired." I, I didn't agree with all of his decisions, but the FBI director is given a ten year term because they are expected to be apolitical. And I felt like he was being fired for political reasons. And you didn't see him as violating his job, even though you might agree with everything. Yeah. Nothing merited dismissal. I, I, I didn't believe so That's as right. a career FBI yeah. agent and, and having served as, yes. as a deputy. So, right. yeah. Um, so I, I went in um, with a lot of reservations. Do I want to work in this administration? As if, if I was afforded the honor of serving as the director of the FBI and got confirmed by the Senate, uh, how would that work? Because it didn't work so well for this other guy. And who, Well, I find myself in a similar predicament. Yeah, That's that exactly. Thing, so that was part of the equation. And then just trying to discern God's movement here. I'd only been at the university for for two years, and I was uh, had asked, been asked to serve by the trustees for a five-year term, and I'd agreed to that. So it was really a, a mixed bag of, of um, trying to look out for the organization that I'd spent all these years in uh, at the FBI. And my concern at the time was I'd heard that they were interviewing another, one other person as, we're the two finalists, and is what I'd heard. Yeah. Nobody, uh, so, and my concern was if that other person is what I would just refer to as a political hack who is just coming in to not, you know, do, turn the FBI into a political organization, I thought, I if I have an opportunity, is this God's way of using me in a way I never could have envisioned? That's Just right. Like I was called to Anderson University, I'd never envisioned that. So I felt like I needed to be open to it. So yeah, went in, um, Vice President Pence came out in the waiting room of the old office and, and uh, greeted me, and I'd known him for a while. And so yeah, we went in and had some small talk about uh, Indiana basketball and things, and then talked about the, um, the role of the FBI director. and. And so, yeah, probably 10 minutes into the interview, uh, the president said, so do you want the job? And 
My sense was he was asking me to tell him why I felt I was the best qualified. And this was your doorway to prove yourself. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to somebody saying, I want you to take this yes, job. Please take the job. Will you accept it? Yeah. I'm offering the job. Will you accept it? And so I, I just told him, I, I said, Mr. President, I'm honored, uh, but I also feel conflicted uh, because I, I have a sense of calling to Anderson University, where I've been two years, as I just said. And so um, he said, well, well, I can understand that. And so tell me a little bit more about that. So we talked a little bit about that. And then he asked if I had some any questions. I did. And I asked him one, uh, a question about his understanding about the relationship between the White House, the office of the president, uh, including all the staff, and the president, him or herself, and the FBI. And uh, so we had a conversation about that. And, and I, he gave me a response, and I, and I told him I'd that wasn't my understanding. I, did, I disagreed with that. So even after that, he said, well, okay. Well, so do you want the job? So this is about 20 minutes now. And, and second time he asked, and, he, and I said, well, again, Mr. President, I'm honored, but I, I do feel conflicted. So he said, well, it sounds like you need some time to think about it. Um, take your time. We're, we're in no hurry, right, guys? And everybody said, oh, no, Mr. President. And, and so, yeah, um, meeting wrapped up, and uh, Vice President walked me out, and we had a brief conversation. And and then it was about a week later before I heard anything, and the president tweeted that he was selecting Chris Ray, who was a friend of mine uh, from the Department of Justice and who I'd run into uh, in the waiting room of the Oval Office <laughs> before. We, so, yeah. so I was relieved. Because that was someone you thought, he could handle this. Absolutely. He, he's yeah. bright, he's articulate, he's, yeah, and he's apolitical. Um, he's trustworthy. Trustworthy, yeah. So and I felt like I could... So I didn't say yes, I didn't say no. I understand. So, yeah. But you, you referenced a calling. What does yeah. that mean to you, John? I mean, yeah. a calling, what, So how does that work for you? Yeah, so it really goes back to being a senior in high school in this car accident. I, I feel like God gave me a second chance in life physically. And even though I haven't uh, followed uh, that exact, it's not a, just a straight line course, um, I have every day uh, got up, and uh, when, when I wake up, I give God thanks for the fact that I woke up, I'm not paralyzed, and I, I pray that I am available. So you know, the number of prayers, but God, give me eyes to see and ears to hear, a heart to love and will to obey what you have for me today. And how can I be of service? Um, and, you know, the, there's the old um, saying from the... 17th century, I think, uh, it's referred to as the Westminster Catechism uh, about uh, what is uh, the chief aim of for people, of man, as at the time it says, and it's um, to glorify and and um, and uh, rejoice, or the, there's another word for it, uh, in God forever. So it's not just this life, and and I should say, the home I live in, the President's home on Anderson University is actually carved out of um, a cemetery. Yes. So I wake up every day, I, I go to bed every night, and I look out, and there's all these tombstones. Now, I suppose some people might be depressed by that. I feel energized because I, I literally think, when I'm waking up, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us, let me rejoice and be glad in it because he's given me life, he's given me breath, he's given me an opportunity to be of service uh, in a way that, I, I just think it gets back to the idea of we, uh, as Christ followers, we have the opportunity to, to live an abundant life. We can either just go through life and, you know, da, 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 or we can see every day as an opportunity to see, okay, God, what do you have today, and what can I do to be part of that? You know, the, the Black Bee study about mm -hmm. hearing God. So, mm -hmm. Where's God at work, and, and where can I join him in that work? And so when I received the call, if you will, to Anderson University, I thought, wow, this was never on my radar. But it's so far out of the box that it, it must be a God thing, so I need to be open to it. And, um, and that was the same thing with the TSA administrator. I thought, I, if it's a God thing, I need to be open to it. And that was Kathy, my wife's, her point about... Um, about being open to positions. She wasn't anxious. Uh, she's from D.C. She didn't want to move from the D.C. Yeah. area. Um, but she was open to it because she said, if this is a God thing, shouldn't we be open to it? And, yeah, I mean, it did, 
John Wesley's covenant prayer, um, you know, I'm no longer my own, but thine put me to what thou wilt. You know, nine different things about surrender. And so I try to take every day as a surrender to God and what God has for me and how I can be of service to honor and glorify God. But I'm hearing you say that in that macro context of, of acknowledgement, I am not my own. Mm. And I think it is uh, beautiful in a way that you've described that you look out on a cemetery. I grew up next door to a cemetery oh, in Seattle. Okay. And I remember playing in it all the time. And, and I found yeah. it a place of, of peace and reflection, yes. so to speak, growing up. So yeah. I, I kind of resonate with that because yeah. it, it puts your life today in perspective. I'm on a journey through right. this world. And there will be a day when I'll leave this world for the next. And so, I mean, that, that That's frames. Right. But I'm also hearing you say that you have a profound sense of specific calling. Mm, yes. You're at Anderson University today because you think, you believe, God has placed you there. And yes. even if a president asks you, you're willing to consider, but right now you landed back. No, this is where I'm supposed to be. Yeah, that's what it came down to. And um, now what I don't know is if, if the president had tweeted that week later, yeah, I've selected John Pistol. <laughs> It's altogether possible uh, yeah. that Mr. Trump might have tweeted an outcome that you hadn't heard of yet. <laughs> well, well, no, that, that was, that, I think that was probably the case. Um, then I, yeah, I, I, yeah, that would have been a different situation. I understand, but, but here you are. But yeah, and, and I believe God can use everybody. Uh, as we've seen biblically, you know, many, many times God uses people, non-believers, unbelievers, whatever, to accomplish God's will. So. Well, and all of your life, uh, has prepared you for this role because Anderson University today mm. has some really dynamic uh, cybersecurity programs, yeah. for instance, yeah. the things that are, you might say, on the cutting edge yes. of a new frontier of vocation and public service. Right. Is that fair? Yeah, I'm excited by some of the things that we're doing. And uh, we just received a, a Lilly Endowment grant of a million dollars to create a Center for Security Studies and Cyber Defense. And yeah, that's clearly a cutting edge uh, area that there's not enough... Uh, qualified people to work in the industry. And also, we started a national security uh, parallel, uh, major. And the whole idea is how can we be, be distinctive, compelling, and relevant in, frankly, a crowded space of higher education, which has changed dramatically over the last several years for a number of reasons. But yeah, so I'm excited by those opportunities. And I'll just put a quick pitch in. So for any of your <laughs> listeners who have a son or daughter or grandchild <laughs> or cousin or friend, considering a career uh, at a fine Christian university, particularly a career, well, we have the number one nursing school in the state of Indiana for two years running now. There you go. And then uh, we also have a great business program with MBA program things. Well, it's a liberal arts school that has and many options. Lots. But cyber options, yeah, that's a big the one. wave of the future is, yeah. is a differentiating factor. It is. Ryan, Cutting pull up, edge. Let, let our uh, audience understand Anderson University and a uh, contact page for them. Yeah, but thank you. In the world in which we live, John, you just described how higher education has mm. changed dramatically. I mean, everything's changing dramatically. Yeah. And, and we've been through a season where, as we began this conversation, mm. trust mm. has been lost in so many things. We're yes. not sure who to trust for our information stream. Uh, we're not sure who to trust uh, institutionally. Mm. Uh, can healthcare be trusted? Mm. Can our public schools be trusted? Can our schools and universities be trusted? Can the government of the United States be trusted? Can the Congress be trusted? Can the president be trusted? Yeah. I mean, there, there are so many shadows. Oh, how about this? Can the church mm. be trusted? Wow. Uh, living what you've lived, Yeah. Um, what would you say to someone who's trying to navigate? Is anything trustworthy? Yeah. And how do I scrub the evidence? How do I... Well, how do I so I, I've got to approach it from a, you know, a Christ follower's perspective of You've got to be rooted and grounded in something. If you're just grabbing for straws on whatever uh, that's out there, that's going to be a tough situation to discern with any amount of clarity or confidence, I would say, that that's the right information. Almost going back to what we talked about with the investigation of the mafia, don't rely on a single source of information, but get multiple sources of information so you can then make your own judgments and and. And critical thinking, that's something at Anderson University we focus on with all students. You know, you're going to learn the material. I mean, that's why you're there. But learn critical thinking skills. And how can we help you do that? Because, as you mentioned, things are changing so quickly that your job is going to change multiple times over your career. And so that's something you need to have critical thinking skills. 
And so we rely on uh, our focus on multiple sources of information that come from divergent perspectives. Don't just rely on what feels good and that's what you, is, is, you know, resonates with you, but be rooted and grounded in something beyond yourself and I would say beyond this world. And, and for me, you know, that's uh, the Word of God and, and how that is timeless and that we are here just for a, a relatively short time. And so what difference can we make now and so as we relate to institutions, don't put your full faith and confidence in a particular institution as run by women and men who are less than perfect, uh, but discern where the good is, support that, uh, look for where there can be improvement, and encourage that improvement. So and, and I don't mean being just blatantly critical about everything, but look for ways yeah. that that uh, you see improvement could be made and then be part of that if you can. Be thoughtful. Be thoughtful. Don't just jump on a train because it's pulling out of the station. Right. Know and, where you're going. <laughs> we, we've lived through a season in our country, I think, mm. where um, many well-meaning people may feel deceived. Mm. Like, I thought it was this, or I right. thought that person would be this, but it proved not to be so. Right. And that's very disorienting, and also we can feel... A certain sense of shame, you know, like how yeah. could I have been so foolish to have followed that or to jumped on that train? I mean, there are so yeah. many dimensions in our public space right now that affects people in our churches too and mm. everywhere. And it seems to me that one of the standout parts of your narrative, and again, this is an embarrassment to you, John. In other words, you're not mm. you're not throwing a light on yourself, but I'm just observing. You've had a very long and multi-dimensional career. Mm. But one of the anchors of that has been a sense of integrity. You know, mm. uh, the word integrity comes from wholeness. So like mm. in, in mathematics, an integer is a whole number that can't be subdivided. Yes. Integrity comes from that same Latin root, a wholeness that mm. cannot be subdivided. You have a certain cachet of integrity that has been recognized and has allowed people to trust you mm. at several important points. And man, as a, as a country, as a people, as, as a community, Making a decision for ourselves to maintain integrity is probably the answer hmm. to everything else. And so my, what, I, what I'm yeah. setting you up for is hmm. integrity, nobody is without flaw. Sure. I mean, we all have our moments, and I'm sure that uh, John Pistol would, if I, if I pressed him, <laughs> you know, you could identify some things in your memory. I wish I hadn't done that. Uh, that was not oh, smart, sure. or that wasn't honest. Yeah. But in the main, you have made some choices. You've made professional choices. Mm. You've made choices with your family and your personal mm -hmm. conduct and so on that have maintained this integrity. Can you, can you help us identify an intersection where you know, I was at a place where I might have gone this way. I might have believed a lie or chased one, mm. differentiated from, no, this is the right thing to do. Yes, uh, and, and a lot of that is just from my experience growing up, being in a, a great godly home, as I mentioned, my parents who... Uh, help me learn about the love of Christ at home uh, with accountability, uh, but then being baptized when I was 12 years old after you know summer church camp, mm -hmm. camp challenge, and then coming back to my home church, Park Place Church of God, and being baptized there. And then uh, for at least the next year, living a life of, of in pursuit of God. But by, by the time I was 13, I'd lost interest in that. Met some friends in junior high who were partiers, um, even in seventh grade, and... Uh, so I made some really poor choices in going and drinking to excess, um, getting drunk a lot, making some really poor choices. And I did that uh, from seventh grade up until the time of my accident, two weeks into my senior you year. You grew into manhood, yeah. pursuing things that you know were not appropriate. Were not appropriate, and I didn't think I'd wanted to do for the rest of my life, but I was having a good time. I was you know, a popular athlete and... And uh, yeah, I was a party guy. And that, um, so, so that my accident, coming back to that, was a wake-up call for me. That I felt like God was saying, John, I've blessed you with so much, and yet you've just thrown it all away, just living in, in pursuit of your own pleasure as opposed to in service to what I've called you to. So that was my wake-up call. And because God did give me a second chance, I don't think he caused the accident. Yeah, yeah. But I think you know, I'm, I had two vertebrae that were broken, and and uh, <laughs> it was a violent collision. Car flipped over, and uh, and I remember standing up through the broken glass and everything with a 
passenger side where I'd been sitting, no seat belts, of course. And the doctor, the surgeon who did the spinal fusion um, several weeks later said, there's no way you should have been able to do that. So I don't think God caused the accident, but I think he prevented mm -hmm. death or paralysis. He spoke to you through it. Yeah. So that, so at every juncture, I've had a choice to say, okay, do I do this for John, you know, make this decision, or do I try to try to be God honoring and glorifying? And and so that's, so yeah, there's lots of, <laughs> we don't no, have time for all those, but that's yeah, a, but, a framework. But that's, but that's a, that's a lens. That's, yeah. that's a perspective you've used at important moments, yeah. which answering that question rightly mm. over time creates an yeah. integrity of character yeah. that puts you where you've been. That's right. what I would say. Yeah. Now, why? Why do you even think there is a God? I mean, yeah. I get that you grew up in a house that taught you about yeah. that. And, and yeah, you have the story of the accident, but you've had a long life. Yeah. You're, you're a smart guy. There is so much broken stuff in this world. Yeah. Why does John Pistol think yeah. there really is a God that I'm even considering that yeah. at these moments? Well, so it's been both experiential for me. I've experienced uh, the love of God, the presence of God. You know, where Brother Lawrence calls us to practice the presence of God. And, and I, as I have tried to do that in daily meditation and devotion and prayer and journaling and other things, I have just experienced the presence of God in my life. Uh, during this pandemic time, I've uh, I've always been physically active since, um, yeah, just always. But I've really enjoyed early morning walks, and every other day, part of that will be run. But I'll go out for a couple of hours if I can. And go when you out. say early morning, what's early? Well, like 5.15. Oh, like that's that. early. I'm, that I'm, might I'm, be some. <laughs> Depend, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not worthy. Okay, no, 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 no. So, I didn't so, need to detour you, but you go out and walk. And yeah, run. and it's a, it's a great, quiet prayer and meditation time. And so I use that um, for, you know, I use the Acts prayer, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. And um, I also have on my calendar every day for 11 o'clock to, to be intentional in prayer. Uh, but that m quiet morning time, and so the first hour will be, it's really a praise and worship. Uh, and I'll have hymns of praise, songs of praise, um, including one of your guests that you also have on Sandy Patty. Some of her songs will come through. Um, and then uh, the latter part, then I will uh, read some devotional materials and, thing, and, and a variety of different things that both comfort me but also challenge me. So who is God calling me to be today? And I, I know it is a Christ follower, but how is God calling me to be in service to others, in service to God, that's what I'm called to, but by serving others? And so it's that daily surrender of, yeah, I am not in charge. Uh, I am not God. God is God and I am not. And thanks be to God. I'm hearing you say that there's a certain discipline of your devotional life yeah. that is nourishing oh, absolutely. your sense of God's reality. Yeah. And you also are a person who's made a, a choice, yeah. and I would call it an intellectual choice, yeah. to recognize the scripture. Yes. The Old and New Testaments as authoritative and, and supernatural in a class by themselves. Yeah. And is is there something that you're holding on to in these very turbulent days that speaks to you, a, a passage or a portion that is like, man, I in this season, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, there are a couple and, and um the, the prologue of John, you know, the first part of that. In in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. That passage keeps coming back to me most mornings. In the last several weeks, of, uh, I have been focusing, for some reason, on Psalm 19. And part of my morning walk, of course, it's dark at 5.15. But, and when it's not cloudy, um, just seeing the stars and you know the heavens declare the glory of God, the earth or the ferment, depending on which version. Sure. Um, and, and then getting down into you know, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. And there's six or seven different things about the statutes and the precepts and the commands and the decrees. And the fear of the Lord is true or endures forever, um, is pure, I'm sorry. And, and so that passage, and then, of course, ends up, you know, let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, my God, my rock and my redeemer. And so I've tried to memorize the, that chapter, and um, I'm almost there. 
And it's such a source of encouragement and nourishment and relationship. I feel like God is speaking directly to me, to saying, see everything I've given you, the heavens up here, uh, and I've got a Skyview app that is fascinating that a friend shared with me. And to say, wow, that uh, you know, the, um, the, the Little Dipper is 5.7 um, million light years away. You know, just crazy. Right. I mean, can't, right. I can't yeah. understand it. Yeah. The but magnitude. That, yeah, the magnitude. And to think that, and again, the scripture, so who am I who is human, who are humans, that you are mindful of me, and yet you have made us a little lower than angels. And again, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable. And so that's, that's a daily nourishment, um, and, and much more so than now I enjoy eating. Uh, and, and once I'm done with my workout and everything, I enjoy having breakfast. Yep. But my soul is nourished in a way that uh, I didn't experience, of course, as a teenager, because I, I wasn't seeking God. And, and I, I believe that God, as I think as Hebrew says, God rewards those who seek him. And so, yeah. John Pistol, do you ever get afraid? I, I have to say that I've watched you at some crisis yeah. moments. Once, yeah. One day you came to my office, you may remember, because my office was across the street from the campus. Mm. There'd been a bomb threat on the campus. Right. And you came over to tell me that you had intersected with the FBI and and you wanted to alert me for my staff. Yeah. Uh, to be alert, not not to be alarmed, and so on. But I, I remember as you walked away from my office, I thought, man, the guy is unflappable. I mean, he <laughs> just, it was just a totally cool and collected in the midst of what proved to be a bomb scare, not right. a reality, but still yeah. frightening. And I, I just have to ask, do you ever, is there anything that frightens you, really? So I wouldn't say frightens. I, I don't live in fear um, because I know whose I am and who I am and I know who my Redeemer is. My Redeemer lives. And so I have no concern about, you know, dying or something because I, I know that just then I graduate into eternal life. And, and that's, that's what uh, we, we look forward to at the right time. Um, I, I do have concerns uh, as opposed to fears. And, and I'm concerned, frankly, for the country right now in terms of our uh, divisiveness and the just the, boy, the political climate um, and uh, you know, just what's what's going on in terms of a smooth transition of power at the time of this uh, taping, and, and just uh, you know, a second article of impeach or a second impeachment that the House is considering today, and just those things. So I have a concern, and I would say a burden uh, for the country and the course we're on. We're we're definitely not the shining light on a hill. Um, that um, that I think that the founding mothers and fathers had in mind to say, mm -hmm. we want to be something that can be looked up to by by the global community, and we're observed by the global community now, but uh, boy, not not favorably, I'd say. So, as you look forward, mm. what's your risk assessment for the country? Yeah, well, where are the risks? What do you think are the are the Achilles heels? Those places. That Pinch points. Yeah, so I think we need to have, uh, f from a biblical standpoint, we need to have some healing. Uh, and usually, uh, at least from my understanding and clearly in my personal experience, healing comes when we seek that. And if we are in need of forgiveness, which we all are, we seek forgiveness from God who gives generously, just like with wisdom, uh, to those who ask. And so I think we need to have some type of uh, public acknowledgement of that, which of course, with over 300 million people in the U.S., there's be no consensus. But just a, an understanding and an appreciation for we either come together as a country or we live even more divided than we are with all the risks attendant to that. And so as opposed to international terrorism and you know, hijackers taking over planes and crashing them into buildings, do we have mobs of people storming uh, the capital or state capitals or government office buildings, or do we have kidnappings or, you know, things like that, murders, because we disagree with somebody. Because of division. Because of division. So profound that we feel like we have to act out in that way. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my concern. Uh, but that being said, 
I am an optimist in life. I think that's who God calls us to be. And so I will do everything in my power to uh, work for peace and justice. There's an expression in the, uh, in the Department of Justice that if you want peace, work for justice, Department of Justice, um, which the FBI is part of. And that's, I mean, it's a, you know, kind of a catchy thing, but I, uh, it's I wisdom, identify with it. sounds like. <laughs> wisdom. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just, yeah. so if I want to see peace in the country, I, I can't do that for the country. I can do it for myself and those that I engage with, and hopefully your your listeners are people who uh, you know seek God's wisdom and discernment and can pray and and ask for that themselves. Um, Ryan just pulled up a, a frame about if you want peace, work for justice, uh, quoting Pope Paul the Sixth. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wherever, wherever the source of the phrasing is, yeah. it, uh, it's, it's certainly within the parameters of a biblical narrative. Yeah. And that justice and peace go hand in hand. Yeah. All that to say, John, <laughs> uh, after this wide ranging review of some of your journey and some of your thoughts, what would you say mm. to our audience today? I mean, if you could just, uh, you, you have this one moment to speak to a country, yeah. to a people, what would you say to them? Well, I, I was interviewed by a local paper here over the weekend, and the reporter asked me that, and, and the, um, the scripture from Second Chronicles came to mind. Um, said, you know, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and, and come and pray and seek my face. Um, and there's other parts of that that I didn't include for that quote because I didn't want to talk about repent of their sinful ways and all that. I was just trying to be welcoming and inviting into a stepping back from the abyss, if you will, of disorder, disunity, and looking forward to a better future, a better tomorrow, from a different lens, as you've said, but with a new paradigm. So what does this country look like in the year 2021 and moving forward? And not to be based in the past, to set aside all those things that have it's almost like the sin that clings so tight. Mm-hmm. And tangled us. Yeah, encumbers and tangles us. So to try to set that aside, so that's my prayer for for the country and for those clearly at Anderson University as we started the second semester today. What does that look like? Well, we want to be difference makers for Christ in the kingdom. That passage, Second Chronicles chapter seven, verse fourteen, mm. famously, is a kind of formula. Actually, it, mm. it, it is a word from the Lord, where He's speaking directly, and He and He says, "If my people, if you think you're one of mine, yeah, then if they humble themselves, and it's always striking to me, especially in this the season, that the whole formula, the whole equation begins there: humility. Right. Right. You can't jump over it. You can't." You can't get around it. No. The rest of the promise of his healing does not come until first there's humility. Maybe yeah. uh, I'm hearing you say that. That there we are. Oh, I there's think, a word for our time. Yeah, I, I think it's paramount. It's just something that we've lost track of um, in many respects. And so, yeah. well, John Pistol. I want to say, it, it's not my place to speak for anyone but myself, but I'm going to pretend today like I, I have a platform to speak for others and mm-hmm. say, we, we thank you for what you've mm-hmm. done uh, in the public interest, because mm-hmm. most of your adult life has been putting your life on the line mm-hmm. for the public good, oh. your, your service in law enforcement in all of its many itinerations has been to protect and to enhance mm. justice in our society. And I just want to yeah. say, I don't want to take that for granted, John. Thank you for that. And in the role that you're carrying now at Anderson University, you also are putting yourself on the line mm. for the high and noble calling of following Christ and helping mm. raise up people in many disciplines of knowledge right. with Jesus as their subject, as as their right. measure. Sure. And of course, your own personal faith has informed all of those chapters. And I just want to say thanks, John. Thanks for being that guy. Mm. And thanks for being with us today on All That to Say. Jim, thank you for the honor and the privilege of, of being on the program. And, and it has been an honor and privilege to have served as, as God has called me in ways I could have never imagined. I'm with you. Amen. Godspeed. Thank you. For more information, visit allthattosay.org. Thank you for joining the conversation. 
don't forget to like and subscribe.